Welcome to the July 24th edition of the PFF Forecast. I'm George. I'm joined by Eric, as usual. Uh, Eric, on location in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which means special recommendations from me for Eric today. We're going to talk about Kyler Murray and whether uh, it was a, whether he's worth the money and what we expect from him going forward. We have a question about hedging, which we're going to dive into and talk about. I am going to tell everyone about my, again, atrocity of a bad beat. Uh, in Formula One, I'm never betting on Ferrari again. What an absolute disaster. And maybe uh, Eric will, will uh, make me happy by telling me about his CFL bets. Let's rock. I, can we pause about the like this is how i know you're such a good friend because i totally and 100 percent sent you something friday with my mm-hmm. slack picture which is a privilege mm-hmm. and i think i we i think i sent you something to the effect of i'm fucking dialed in on cfl right now yes and obviously you could have used that uh you could have used that to harm me and you didn't <laughs> And so that I... you're welcome. It get, it did give me a little bit of life though, to know that on Friday night, that was, that was your vibe. It, it really like, I felt like I understood your spirit in that moment. So can you tell, can you explain a little bit? Like what, what do you mean by dialed in on CFL right now? I, so in the last three weeks, I've lost one CFL bet and it was, it was a play where I bet the team plus four and there was mm-hmm. a deep shot in the end zone with 30 seconds left. The guy comes up with it, lands on the ground, ball flops out. Somehow it doesn't hit the ground, gets intercepted. So other than that, and not only that, but I'm also hitting these middles that are amazing, right? So uh, my Hamilton tie cats were plus eight and a half <laughs> the other night. And of course I teased down the favorite to minus two and a half, but I bet the tie cats too. Right. Cause mm-hmm. like, Mm-hmm. game lands five right everything's working out everything's yeah. coming up then i have like this big bet on winnipeg and i didn't and, and i and i bet what's them their name te- the, are they the, the blue, blue bombers? bombers yeah and and i i don't i tease them down to one and a half i bet them minus seven minus seven and a half moves in my direction closes minus eight and a half they went by 14 and they do so by like getting an interception in the end zone when they're trying to backdoor. So I've, I've just been, I've had a charmed existence. And then right now there was a Toronto Saskatchewan game that got moved from Saturday to Sunday because of COVID. And I, uh, and, and, but it moved, it moved without anybody knowing why. And so mm-hmm. I got the dog Toronto at plus five and a half, plus five, plus three and a half. And then I'm coming back and taking Saskatchewan plus two and a half. So I got this like big ass middle here that if the game, like if Saskatchewan wins by like three, it's gonna be a massive day for me. So it, it, it's been a it's been a pretty good one so far, I would say, in the CFL. The first week I lost like a grand betting it, and then like I've clawed all the way back, like being up a few grand. So I, I'm 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 pretty like thrilled about the, the season so far, and it's kind of like kept me, you know, there, there's at least some sports on, you know, for when you're talking about. Um, when you're talking about Formula One, and I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, the moral of this story is you need to give out more CFL bets and I need to give out apparently fewer, uh, formula one bets. So here, here's where I'm at on, on Sunday morning, I woke up a little later than I had anticipated. And I kind of had a a thesis on the formula one race, the French grand prix. My thought here was it's very, very hot in, in France. One of the hottest races that there has been. And what that does is it creates uh, more tire degradation. And for people that are new to Formula One at all, this is a big deal because if your tires go, it can take seconds off your lap time and seconds are massive in in Formula One. So the the Red Bull, it's been between Red Bull and Ferrari. Ferrari uh, have uh, Charles Leclerc on pole, but Red Bull kind of right behind him, Max Verstappen is in second. Sergio Perez in third, uh, uh, Lewis Hamilton is, is starting fourth. And the other Ferrari, Carlos Sainz, way, way in the back because he had to take a penalty. 
but the Ferraris were quicker. And in fact, Carlos Sainz, who was starting in the back, was quickest through all the practice sessions through qualifying as well. And it, it, notoriously, they have been better at managing tires. So their their car and the way that it's constructed is destroying the tires at a at a lesser rate than than Red Bull. And this this can matter. This can mean a big big difference. So uh, Max Verstappen, despite being in second, has had the huge advantage on the straights. Their car is just faster there, and Ferrari has the advantage on on the uh, the turns. So uh, Max Verstappen is actually the favorite. Leclerc is plus 140. And my whole thought is, well, this is, you know, Ferrari is going to, is going to, their tires are going to wear less. They're going to come away with the, the victory here. And I like Carlos Sainz being the fastest on the track to kind of make his way up and, and finish uh, in, in the podium. So I bet Leclerc to win at plus 140. I bet Carlos Sainz to finish top three at uh, three to one. I, I pick, uh, what else I did? The one uh, bet I ended up winning, Lewis Hamilton, to beat Sergio Perez. He was starting behind him. He ended up uh, beating him. I, and a couple of other smaller bets. So check this out. Race starts. Leclerc gets out to, to the lead and is actually kind of uh, increasing that lead over time. His, his tires are, seem to be holding on. Uh, Verstappen pits to, to get new tires. Leclerc it continues to maintain that lead. And uh, so Leclerc is in the lead and about lap, I was 18, 19, 20, Leclerc's uh, car just flies off the track and he, he careens into the, the wall. <laughs> Has to, yeah. is DQ'd. This is the second time that I have bet Leclerc to win. He has been leading and doing really well, like fa- fairly, you know, fairly comfortably, I say. And his car has just died <laughs> when I have bet him. So I'm apoplectic, right? But I still have, I still have a glimmer of hope because Signs is still out there and he is the fastest person on the, on the track. So he is marching his way up. And the, but the, the only thing is that when uh, Leclerc went into the, into the wall, that means a, a safety car comes out. And so because of that, all the cars have to slow down. So they take that advantage to go into the pits and change tires. The, Ferrar- the Ferraris have been a nightmare from strategy, uh, the entirety. They, they always just fuck things up. They can't get his tire on quickly enough, so it takes longer. And as he's coming out of the pit, he almost hits somebody, gets a five-second penalty. So, like, you know, all odds are against him. But he's he's out there, and he's just – he's March, he's chomping people down. He's by far the, path, the fastest person out there. So he's on his way uh, into third place. He's going to, He's going to get into third place. But he has this five second penalty and he's on tires that are uh, a little bit softer than the rest of the the, the cars that are out there. And so his team is like freaking out that he's not going to be able to maintain on these tires. And they're even telling him to pit to change tires as he's passing the car in third. Like uh. they're on the radio, like pit, pit. And he's like, he, he says back in the radio, guys, I'm, I'm literally passing someone right now. Can you chill the fuck out? So his stupid engineers are like, wow, we have to make a pit. We have to make a pit. They pit him with 10, 10 laps to go. And he has to serve his penalty in the pit stop, which means that he re-enters the track in like 18th place with 10 laps to go. So even if he's, you know, two seconds faster a lap, he, he, he you know, he, he'd have to be basically two seconds faster a lap. That's not happening. So he can't, they basically take him out of the running to finish in third and what is a universally disastrous uh, move. And so it cost me what I thought was a really great chance at, at cashing a three to one bet. Uh, so Ferrari really fucked me over uh, twice. And um, let's just say my motto from now on is never again with Ferrari, never again. Yeah, that's just, I mean, it, it sounds like, I'm so glad by the way. And I love, uh, you know, I love that uh, our, our mutual friend, Seth Walder asked us to be in that Calcutta. But honestly, after listening to you talk about how, how what goes into this, I'm so glad I didn't you know, go in there and be the biggest freaking <laughs> fish that would have been in the, the group because there's obviously a lot uh, that goes into it. That's, uh, man, that's, that sucks. It was, oh, it was if it makes brutal. you feel any better, the Indiana Fever right now are donking away what was a pretty decent chance to cover the spread today. <laughs> um against the Dallas Wings who are a, a a meltdown factory to say the least um but they are not melting down yet we'll see if, if that if that stays uh, um so okay 
You're, By the you're way, talk, we got talk. we got a really good uh, Twitter uh, uh, comment from uh, Nagastacho, uh-huh. who said, "PF of George, PF of Eric. I've got a master's in civil engineering, and I can't figure out what the what this Minions movie is about either." Hashtag Syndicate. <laughs> Love that. By the way, um, yeah, because uh, to, for anyone that's that didn't listen to last week's episode, Eric claimed that he could not figure out the Minions movie, and I thought that was like it's the easy. It's just minions going around doing funny shit like there ain't there's nothing like that deep about it but i guess maybe it's um maybe maybe it's so simple that it throws like overly analytical people off the the scent which maybe is just showing my own uh you know what but um let's talk let, let's talk kyler murray here by the way there is a 40 percent off sale on pff right now with any annual subscription so you can go read all about kyler murray you can check out um, all of the different data that we are going to talk about in uh, in discussing and dissecting this deal um, for 40% off at pff.com. And uh, by the way, big things will be coming soon. So you'll want to get uh, in there and get ready to rock for the, the season. Um, deal first reported on Thursday, worth $230.5 million, includes a $160 million guarantee. And that uh, all nets out to a $46.1 million uh, average, which is, of course, second now uh, in, in the NFL uh, behind only Aaron Rodgers, who I think his average is like 50, 52 or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think this seems like a win for, for Kyler Murray, certainly given all of the, and I don't know if, whether you think it's propaganda it sure seems like it now, given that they ended up signing him, right? Where it was like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, this guy's a bad leader. I don't know if we can have him, you know, like all that stuff, which is very, very interesting. Um, but w- let me just ask you this. Like, you see this deal come through. I assume you're not overly surprised, but do you, is it a deal that you think makes sense? Well, I think that the hard part is, like, the realities of the league are that a quarterback either makes this kind of deal, he's the next player up, mm-hmm. or he doesn't, right? Like, we right. we haven't seen a top draft pick at the position make, you know, modest money since Blake Bortles. And mm-hmm. we we all believe that Murray has outperformed Blake Bortles. He, his war... Wow, bold. Hold on. The last, we, we his war the last seconds? three years, he was 0.79 war as a rookie. 2.24 war as a sophomore and then 3.10 war last year, despite missing three games, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, if you multiply that by 10, which is usually what you do for quarterbacks, that's 31 million. You know, so obviously this is expecting him to be more like a four win player, um, which, you know, if you if you extrapolate over a whole season, you can kind of get there. Right. Especially with inflation. Um, the problem is the problem I have. It, and and it, and it really has something to do with this particular deal. It's just that, you know, when you do this and you haven't accomplished anything yet, it's just so hard, right? Like you think about like, the I, I, so I'm going to take this back and I'm not trying to put them in the same category, but you think about the Raiders with Derek Carr, right? So the Raiders with Derek Carr, you had 2014, they were bad. 2015, they're a little better. 2016, mm-hmm. they make they they have a 12 and four season, not too dissimilar to the Cardinals last year. They make the playoffs, they bow out in round one. Carr gets hurt, right? That's a big part of it. But they bow out in round one, gets the big contract, and it takes forever and a day just to even get back to the playoffs. And that team made the playoffs with a negative point differential, not necessarily a great team. And you have this melees. You know, the Cardinals, now they were terrible in 2018. They, they, gave, they like generated like half a yard per play less than the next worst offense with, with Josh Rose and Sam Bradford, uh, Mike McCoy at offensive coordinator, et cetera. But they, they haven't accomplished anything with Murray, right? They, mm-hmm. They've had, you know, one, one basically 500 season that, that they tanked at the end. And then last season, they got a second place finish in their division. And no chance in the playoffs. I mean, they got absolutely rolled by the, the Rams. So then you come to the table with Murray and it's like, okay, that's great. But if Murray is unable to get you to the promised land on rookie money, right? When you can pay DeAndre Hopkins $27 million a year, when you can, you know, have Chandler Jones on the roster, when you can, um, you know, 
have, you know, Rodney Hudson and AJ Green, and like you have a veteran laden lineup, you can make mistakes, right? Zayvon Collins and Isaiah Will, uh, Isaiah Simmons, two linebackers in round one the last few years, haven't really performed that well, but it hasn't really mattered that much mm -hmm. because of the advantages that I just said. Now you come to the table with Murray on 41 point, $46.1 million per year, and then you're going to peel back with some of those advantages, right? You, you don't have Chandler Jones anymore. You don't really have a cornerback who is a veteran who's any good. Uh, your linebackers are still going to struggle because that, you know, that's who they've been so far. Your edge rushers are Marcus Golden and Cam Thomas, I think. And your offensive line is just okay. They did get Hudson back. You know, they did get uh, Hollywood Brown, which is nice. But the question becomes, George, like, do you think, I mean, does it get better for here, from here for the Cardinals? Because I think that's what, <clears throat> that's the issue that I come up with. Yes. Well, let me, let me, uh, let me take a stand here. Okay. Uh, let's rewind to last, last season through the first, I would say eight weeks, seven weeks of the season. I remember sitting in a room with you <laughs> midnight, 1.00 AM bleary eyed few five hour energies deep, you know, as we do every Sunday night. Uh, by the way, just even thinking about that has me super excited for yeah. football the season season. Yeah. Can't, cannot wait. Um, but uh, you said, you know, the Arizona Cardinals, not the best, but the most impressive team thus far. And I, you were right. I mean, they were very, very impressive, but the impressiveness was all Kyler Murray. The guy was do. if you watch those first seven weeks of the season, he had, I think 4% of his throws, uh, sorry, let me be clear. He like 12% of his throws were big time throws our highest graded throws. It was like 4% ahead of the next closest guy. Mm -hmm. And if you watch those and I did, they were all, I mean, Herculean plays that had nothing to do with anything other than Kyler Murray being a superhero. Now what happens towards the end of the season? Deandre Hopkins gets hurt and you go, who is Kyler Murray throwing the ball to the corpse of AJ green? Okay. The corpse of AJ Green is the person that Cliff and all his infinite wisdom is, is trotting out there over and over and over again for Kyler Murray to throw the ball to. I mean, nothing sums up the Cardinals season better than that. Uh, remind me who it was against uh, again, but what, when Kyler threw the back shoulder to AJ Green and got returned for a touchdown yeah. in what, what was probably the worst wide receiver play I've seen in, in, a, in a long time. Now, despite all that, you look at the three years since Kyler Murray has been drafted. 2019, 27th in PFF grade. 2020, 13th in PFF grade. Last year, he was seventh in PFF grade overall and showed dramatic improvement in some really important areas. And I'll, I'll talk about those here in a second. He was also third in PFF grade from a clean pocket, first in big time throw rate, fifth at avoiding turnover worthy plays. And for a guy that scrambled a lot was actually below league average and percentage of pressures that turned into a sack to that point. He was one of the, I think they were actually the only team and ended up this way. The only team where, when he did not, you know, on dropbacks where he did not attempt to pass, they actually had positive EPA gained. In other words, the guy was making something out of nothing, right? When he was under pressure, he was taking sacks at a low rate. He was scrambling really well. He was doing all these things that really made the team better. And he showed a lot of improvement. I mean, you, I talked about the, the grade there, but thinking about what he did over the middle of the football field, well below average in his first couple of years, but in uh, last season was above average in terms of uh, accuracy percentage above average in terms of big time throw rate, passer rating, all of those different things. And um, what, some of the, the things that really stuck out to me were, you know, how he handled the blitz, which wasn't something that he had been particularly good at uh, in the past. So 2019, 77 pass rating versus the blitz, 2020, 93 pass rating versus the blitz, 2021, 112 pass rating versus the blitz. Um, EPA was 0.24. The average against the blitz was 0 0.00. So like, the guy was doing some really impressive things last year. And that was a, that was continuing a trend upward. So to me, it looks like Kyler Murray is improving and I get all the narrative around, maybe he's not a great leader, all these different things, but for a guy, and I'm not going to judge on that at all, but for a guy who 
uh, has improved in so many key areas every single step of the way, despite DeAndre Hopkins, their best receiver, being injured and A.J. Green being the guy that he had to throw the ball to. And that, to me, <clears throat> is, is incredible. I would pay him. The question that I have for you, though, is this. And I'm surprised you brought up Derek Carr because the quarterback that I'm thinking about is Lamar Jackson. You know, he is up for a contract. I am, I am going to guess that his contract is going to be somewhere in this range, right? It would stand to reason there. Do you think that he ends up getting more than Murray? Would you pay him more than Murray? Like, this is the thing that I'm really interested in because I, I feel like the narrative around Lamar has been similar to Murray and that people like to poke holes at them for various reasons. And yet, if you look at the data, like there's a lot of reasons to believe these guys are top, you know, five potentially quarterbacks in the NFL. Yeah, we we talked about Lamar Jackson last time um, and how much linebackers sort of stand in place with him. Uh, I did a, um, I, I did, I showed some folks on Twitter. If you want to look at PFF underscore Eric at the, the speed of edge rushers since 2019 uh, against pass plays for quarterbacks and Lamar Jackson elicits the second slowest uh, among players with more than hundred dropbacks. Only Josh Allen faces slower, uh, basically why, why, distances traveled by edge rushers in the NFL. So um, and that's actually gotten worse over time. So people maybe are less tepid about rushing Lamar Jackson than they have been in the past, but that was something I thought was interesting. He's leading the NFL. Kyler Murray is second, by the way, in yards before contact on designed runs. So taking away sneaks and stuff like that. Lamar Jackson is first in the NFL. Kyler Murray second at a little over three yards per carry before contact um you also see guys like jk dobbins and gus edwards up on the top of that list for obvious reasons right with lamar mm -hmm. you know sort of keeping linebackers at bay um so you know lamar has been an mvp before um last season now i think somebody rightfully called out i mean they were not scoring a lot of points in the games that he was winning for them last year but you know at some point like the fact that they win with him They've never had wide receivers that have been paid in the top 20 while he's been on his deal, like top 20 in the NFL. So I think all of this is to say the, the exact question I have about Murray, which is can the guy succeed when you take away some of the benefits of being on a rookie deal? I think for Lamar Jackson, the answer is yes. And we had that natural experiment last year where, you know, you lose Peters, you lose, uh, you know, Ronnie Stanley, you already lost Orlando Brown to a trade. Um, Yonda left after 2019, uh, all the running backs went out like, and they were eight and three and they were the one seed in the AFC. And I'm not saying Lamar was the only reason for that, but he was certainly a part of that. I think, you know, the pro it's so hard. I think if you're the Ravens, you deal with the risk of Lamar Jackson by nature of the way he plays might not have as long of a career as some of the more traditional passers. You deal with that risk. You pay him, you know, you, you give him that contract. Um, I just think it may, it's so hard because he's his own agent, right? And anything, mm -hmm. any sort of maneuvering that they do is going to be looked on with skepticism by Lamar. So far, Lamar being his own agent has worked to his benefit because he's waited and waited and waited, and the quarterbacks keep getting paid in front of him. Mm -hmm. And so his contract theoretically is going to be above that. But I think – it's it might end up hurting him because I don't think the Ravens are going to want to go to the table with a contract that leaves them completely hung out to dry. Should some of the risk that I think reasonable Lamar detractors have come to fruition. Yeah. So. So who would you, who would you pay? Let's say that you had the choice to pay one of these guys to be your quarterback which one are you offering are you making the offer let's say it costs you 47 million which, which of these guys are you paying 47 million first a lamar jackson okay my next question because i think that's the to me that's the easy answer just a, like gut gut reaction right because of all the things that lamar has accomplished that you've just enumerated but he, okay, so here's my question. If, if Kyler Murray has John Harbaugh, like 
I, I know that we talk about the things that Kyler Murray has had going for him, namely DeAndre Hopkins, but like the offensive line has not been good. Besides DeAndre Hopkins, there's there's no one there. It doesn't appear that Cliff Kingsbury really kind of gets it, you know, whereas John Harbaugh clearly does. I I almost want to say, like, let's pump the brakes for a second and look at what Kyler Murray has done in spite of some of the decisions in his organization. Now, Lamar Jackson has been brilliant, but has had a brilliant organization behind him as well that I think has really, you know, brought his talents to light, has supported him, has changed their offense, all of those different things. And you mentioned no, you know, receiver in the top 20. Yes, Mark Andrews is phenomenal. They drafted Bateman. Like they have made those investments there. And, you know, they have also changed their offense completely to support Lamar, who is nowhere near as accurate of a thrower as Kyler Murray. I mean, Kyler Murray was third in what we deem accurate throws. So that's like right in the breadbasket or basically in stride or, you know, on the guy's frame. He Mm -hmm. was third in the NFL in that regard and well above the league average on throws 10 plus yards downfield. So you know, it's it's tough because then you you look at the data and you go, man, Murray is a better passer and he's a really good runner. And I watch Cardinals games and I go to myself, do they know that Kyler Murray is this good at running the football? Like, I just don't feel like it's creative or, in, or mm-hmm. you know, like, like nothing about the Cardinals offense when I watch it. I go, oh man, this, this is taking uh, Kyler Murray's efforts and abilities and multiplying or, you know, it's shining a light on them. Whereas I watched the, the Ravens and Lamar is brilliant, but I also see an offense and a, and a, and an organization that is doing everything they can to highlight that. So it's also hard for me to take out some of the things around like leadership and all that. I gun, you know, gun to the head. I, to me, Lamar Jackson is the, is the guy that I want in the locker room. I just, I just feel that his teammates you know, believe in him. There is league wide respect for him in a way that I don't think Kyler gets it. And, um, you know, that's just me on the outside looking in, I could be completely wrong, but like, I don't know, we've heard things from people that, that are in the league that are talking to players. And I think that's bad that backs that up. So it's tough. Like just looking at the data, Eric, I do think you have to say like Kyler Murray could be could be the better guy it was also a guy that that came out you know uh, of college with a with a higher you know uh floor right mm-hmm. um so man it's it's really really tough because I, I think we did this debate a while ago and it's like it's it's lamar lamar is amazing but i i do think that that underestimates what kyler murray has done with i think not that great of a supporting cast. I mean, his top targets last year (laughs) on third down, AJ Green, under pressure, AJ Green, first the blitz, AJ Green, in the red zone, AJ Green. AJ Green was not good enough to be the fourth receiver on the Bengals. Like, you know, like for all of the things that Lamar had going against him, he was never throwing to the corpse of AJ Green. Yeah, I think the hard part with me then is like you're never you're you you can't sort of divert you can't divorce Murray from the Cardinals and you can't divorce Lamar from the Ravens at this point. Like the Ravens are very clearly, you right. know, still like, hey, we're gonna slap the tag on you if you don't, you know, commit long term to us. You know, and Murray was the same thing. I mean, the fact is, like, the die was cast here with Murray um, because, you know, Cliff and Kime got contract extensions this offseason despite really having accomplished nothing together. Um, And so there was no way they could have moved on from Murray with a straight face. So, you know, so, like, I agree with you that, you know, if if you put them, if you switch them, you might get more out of Murray than you get out of Jackson, but like you can't switch. I, I get that you can't. I yeah, understand I, that, I, but, I, so but I think like, that's I, the that's the benefit of us sitting in a in a chair in a hotel and in an apartment right now is we can have these kind of thought experiments. And I think like I, I, I like think, I like under I like under on on the Cardinals this year. I, I just but I is it because the, of Murray or is it because of all of the Cardinalsness? Yeah, I mean, my my issue is, did they improve from last year? No. 
no, were I- they like you look at their defense, it's a complete mess. And I know that they actually did well. Uh, Vance Joseph did, I think, a pretty good job. Friend of the podcast, Remember friend of the, the podcast from way back in the day. Um, but they're not going to improve. The I think the Rams and Niners are both probably as good, if not better, than last year. Um, their win total last year was eight and a half, it's eight and a half now. Uh, last year they won. Let me look here. They they won as road underdogs like six times last year, five or six times last year, twice with Colt McCoy at quarterback. Um, I, I but I, I just don't see that repeating itself, right? Like I, I don't see them punching above their weight class. And then you look at the first three weeks, right? So we all talk about um, how we all talk about how uh, Kingsbury like struggles down the stretch. When you look at their schedule to open here, they open with Kansas City, then at Vegas, and then home to Rams, like they could start 0-3, right? And then and then where do they go? They could also start 3-0 because Cliff they could starts, start, you're, you're right. starts I mean, hot. I don't see them beating the Chiefs, but yes, they, they, they Of could. course not. I'm shocked. I'm shocked I'm that shocked. the Kansas City Chief himself does not see them beating the yes. Chiefs. Uh, the, the um, just a, you mentioned two things. First, uh, on the topic of divorce, um, you know, no one can quite be Elon Musk going and, and uh, getting True. every single um, billionaire in Silicon Valley to divorce their wives because he what wants was... to have an affair with them on the on the factory floor of a of a Tesla Giga Center or whatever the hell they call it. Did you see that? So yeah, so, your so, your yeah. buddy uh, Dan uh, or Divine, yeah, Matt, Matt, right? Matt Divine, yeah, yeah, member of the syndicate, member of the syndicate, good guy. He's a, he, he's act, he deserves some kind of uh, you know. Uh, within the syndicate. I don't know. I don't know what, what the levels of the syndicate are. Certainly not something we should ask Simon Hunter, uh, pro better. Um, but, uh, Which by the way, did you listen to that podcast by Rob and Johnny? I haven't yet, but that's Honestly. the circles off podcast, correct? Yes. And hysterical. Like they basically played that podcast and broke down every word that Simon yeah. said. It's a good go. I'm going to listen to it. I advise everyone to go listen to it. But uh, the story for those of the people that that didn't see it. And I believe this scoop was broken by Emily Glazer, who is the wife of uh, our friend, Kevin Clark Clark, uh, of the Ringer NFL podcast. And so uh, Sergey Brin, who is one of the founders of Google, divorced his wife last year after finding out that his wife had a short affair (laughs) with Elon Musk, which let me just make something super clear. If your wife girlfriend, friend, sister, mother, whatever, dog, so much as looks at whatever the hell that is that Elon Musk is, and you see them look at them, like if that happened to me, I'm, I'm, I'm divorce, moving, rehabilitating my life to try and keep myself from being on, you know, on the top of a tall building. That is just ridiculous, like absurd and ridiculous. Um, because he's just like such a scummy, disgusting human being. Um, but uh, I don't know where I'm I'm going with this. I just thought it was comedic and hilarious because Elon Musk is just a, a pile of trash. I, I mean, the guy looks like a rectangular prism, as we discussed <laughs> last time yes. uh, on the show. But he's also like, I mean, he does not come from great stock. I mean, what didn't his dad like have a kid with his two with his sister or his something dad had like that? Two kids. Or, yeah. His two kids with his stepdaughter. And the story was, oh, yeah, it just kind of happened. Uh, we happened to be staying in the same house like one summer or something. Yeah. And then See, it this kind of stuff dead. is just like, oh, look, she like brushed up against me. And look, we have two kids. Like, I can't do this stuff. Um, let's uh, talk so, about. Anyways, I don't know why why I, I got on that. But this the no, second thing. It is funny. I mean, the guy's <laughs> fucking ridiculous. But but um, the second thing that you brought up, though, which um, was the you know, improvement of the team and like, where are they improving? And I think the one, I mean, the number one place that I would be looking for improvement would be from Cliff. Guy makes very poor fourth down decisions. Unlike Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan does not make up for it with brilliant schematics. schematics. We he does have about, good scheme uniqueness. Of course he, he has good okay. scheme uniqueness. Like, his scheme terrible. is so trash that it's super unique. No one is yeah. doing that garbage. That's yeah, I understand the uniqueness. I just don't think that it's unique in the right way. Um, uh-huh. Anyways, my uh, my social media research, which is what I do during the off season, 
has told me that Cliff has been really taking his mind off of football this summer by spending time with a, uh, I, I'm not sure, she, she Russian? Uh, some Russian uh, model, uh, social media model or, or influencer, or whatever you want to call her, um, who was then at his Arizona pad uh, over the past couple of weeks. She's now moved back. So it appears that Cl- Cliff's mind is back on football. So he's got a couple of weeks to like, you know, rejigger the scheme. My point being, I don't expect him to show up. I don't expect the Cardinals to show up with some whole unique take on life, right? Like what that tells me is, yeah, we're just going to run it back. And like, you know, may the best man win. Ball don't lie. Like we got unlucky yeah. last year. And the answer is like, no, you know. Well, you're just so, not that good. Like that's if, my, if, yeah. if, if the Kansas City Chiefs struggle because because the defenses in the NFL are outwitting them and their quarterback is Patrick Mahomes, you can't just freaking roll the ball out there when your quarterback's Kyler Murray. You actually have to outwit the people around you. And that's like just simply not going to happen. So speaking of outwitting, the people around you, Eric, if you want to outwit the members of your fantasy league, which I know we all want to do, then you should go to underdog fantasy and start playing best ball uh, drafts. Cause what that is, is the best way for you to prepare for your fantasy draft. Obviously, in addition to coming to PFF, that's probably the best way for you to get uh, something out of those best ball drafts, but go to underdog fantasy play in the $10 million total prize best ball mania tournament. You don't, you just draft. You don't have to worry about trades or waivers or start sets, any of that bullshit, because it's just the best score each week that, uh, that plays on your team. And so you do a good draft, you draft a good team and you've got, excuse me, a chance at winning millions of dollars, which is really freaking cool. Use promo code PFF when you sign up and you'll get your first deposit matched up to a hundred dollars. And if you play 10 of those dollars, with promo code PFF, you get a free, PFF subscription. So go download the underdog fantasy app or go to underdogfantasy.com. Start playing best ball today in preparation for your drafts. And of course, go check out all of the great fantasy content on PFF. Uh, The fantasy guys started writing their strategy guides. And this is my heroine. I read all the strategy. I, I show up ready to rock. I've got it all mapped out. And rumor has it that those strategy guides will be a part of the new PFF fantasy tool that we'll be uh, launching here very shortly. So um, you'll probably want to go make uh, make use of that when it arrives. All right, let's talk uh, very briefly about hedging. We got a really good question from a member of the syndicate, Lucas Volman, at Lucas underscore Volman on Twitter. He said, quick question on hedging bets. I made an abnormal bet on Tom Brady to be the MVP this year while he was technically retired at 45 to 1. By the way, I have incredible bet envy. Is there a scenario where you would hedge this bet with another MVP candidate during any point of the season? He tagged both of us and said, thanks. And he shared a picture of the bet slip. He indeed did bet $750 at 45 to one. So his potential payout is basically 35 grand. Now, this makes me incredibly jealous because I obviously, my favorite bet of the entire year last year was Brady at 16 to one to an MVP. He was the best, player in the NFL last year and was robbed of the MVP by some garbage ass voting towards Aaron Rodgers. So I love this bet. Are you hedging it? So, yeah. So let's just give out a little bit of information here. So right now Brady is eight to one to win MVP on DraftKings. That requires a break even percentage of 11.11%. 45 to one requires a break even of 2.2%, right? So you've moved Mm -hmm. this thing nine percentage points. That that's a really good bet. Um, in my opinion, what you don't want to do because this is a sizable amount of money. This person's bet here. It well for one, the 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 real thing is like you shouldn't hedge unless the hedge bet is plus EV. That's generally the rule, right? And the nature of these these mul- these markets that are basically one way is that. And look, like, I believe you can, I can't remember if, if Circa will do this. I, I have logged in there, but you could bet the no. That's going to require a pretty sizable bet to, mm-hmm. to, to, to like sort of hedge out here. If you actually yeah. just want to directly hedge, the no is probably, so if it's nine to one, you're probably laying like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to maybe butcher this, but like minus 1500 probably, right? So you could very easily 
have just like hedge this out and make a huge profit, but you have to be able to get down that much on the MVP and you're not going to be able to, right? Like mm -hmm. even Circo who has great limits are not going to be able to get for you to get that down. You're basically just going to make it so that you don't lose $750 if he doesn't win, right? right. The MVP. So my, my approach would be, okay, look at the MVP odds. If there is a player that you think is plus EV, then bet that player. Mm. Um, if there's not, then don't. And, you know, usually these things narrow down to like four or five players in like, you know, the half, you know, four or five players, um, you know, by, you know, by, by October. Right. Mm -hmm. And Brady plays a bunch of teams that are fairly good. He plays Kansas city, he plays Dallas, uh, early on, I believe Buffalo too early, if I'm not mistaken. So they, so he's going to either be in the race or he's not. And if he's not in the race, then this bet's dead anyway, right? And and you know, unless you know who the beneficiary of that is going to be, which if it was a market where you had both sides, the the beneficiary would be not Brady. Yeah. But but you don't know what the beneficiary is going to be. Now, if you get to October, like if. My my thought is if you like Brady enough to make this bet, then you probably like him enough to think that he's going to have a good enough September to be in it, right? Yep. And by the time you get through September, then you're probably narrowing the field on the three or four players, in which case, given the VIG and everything, you probably can actually hedge out by mm -hmm. then if you want to. That would be my take, would be like, just wait a month and see what happens. Because right now, the VIG is so massive, massive. on this market that the the nine percent that you got here on the on the, the value you're not going to be able to pick back up betting again i would just say this if i had this bet down okay what i would say right now on this podcast would be if i win we're going to invite all the members of the syndicate to vegas and we're going to rent out have a good time stadium swim and it's going to be an absolutely electric scene okay that's that's what i'm doing Maybe we should try and do that at some point. Uh, we should find some bets to to put like a grand on, and you know, it's some ridiculous odds. And if that that happens, we're throwing an absolute rager. Uh, that's what I would be doing. I agree completely with you. So, you know, either you feel there are bets out there that are both a hedge and plus EB. Which, to be clear, like if Brady plays poorly. I was actually trying to think about this. If Brady plays poorly, what's the most likely thing that you can actually bet on that you believe is happening if he plays poorly? Yeah, it's nothing, and, right? It's like... Well, I, I, so I'm thinking through it and I'm going, the Saints winning like the division? Like to me, <laughs> that, you know, that actually might be the best, you know, because if you're not, bet to your point, if you're not betting Brady no on the MVP, which I don't think you're doing at this point. I mean, because you'd have to get so much money down. Do you want to use that liquidity up right now? I, my answer there is definitively no. You've made a great bet. Be excited about that. Put your liquidity down on other things, maybe even in the <laughs> fucking, you know, index funds, like would be where I, I might put them. Um, but you you look at the Bucks um schedule and you know, so you're you're talking about kind of that early you know, start to the season, right? So they they start off with, I believe they start off with Dallas on Sunday night. Yes, that's going to be an incredible game. Now, they play at New Orleans week two. They play Green Bay. They play Kansas City. If they go 4-0, and okay, and, and then they have Atlanta, Pittsburgh, Carolina, you will know by, by the start of October, you know, if, if Brady goes and beats Kansas City at home, if he beats Aaron Rodgers, last year's MVP, he has both those games at home. You know, I think you're in a situation where you're looking at uh, uh, he's he's got a, a really good shot and you can kind of see who else might be in the race. But if he doesn't, you know, and, and he ends up not like I think if they're one in three at that point, right, that's like that's that makes it hard for him to win. To me, that means that there's a there's a higher probability of a catastrophe in New Orleans, right? Who he's never played well against, all those things. So, you know, but then I think I look, I you know, take a step back and I go, Am I really going to hedge this bet with New Orleans to win the division? And the answer is just no. It's it's not. There just isn't a high enough correlation. Like the the Saints are not that good, and Brady even playing at eighty percent is going to have that team good enough to win the division. So I don't think. 
I, I really don't think there is a bet other than Brady. No, yeah, that definitive, maybe. like that you have that you feel good enough about the correlation of that and Brady not winning MVP. So I, I'm waiting with you as well. And I think that the nice thing is that because of that first four weeks, you know, you will know quite a bit. And if he comes out guns blazing uh, in, in those games, then, you know, you've got yourself in a really good spot. I think here's the one that I like actually as a hedge. And I, and I, it's not that big of a deal, but it's Dennis Allen, 35 to one to be coach of the year. Hmm. Yeah, because, right. right. Because if new Orleans, you know, if new Orleans goes in and, and whoops Brady's ass, it's going to be the defense and Dennis Allen's going to get all of that. Um, and they don't even have to win the division for Dennis Allen when coach of the year. But the more that I think about the coach of the year, like I think it's down to three guys. It's O'Connell, it's Rivera, and it's Dennis Allen. Like one of these NFC teams, if you look at my coach of the year article on PFF.com, one of the one of the things I noticed is that coaches with four wins above replacement quarterbacks don't win coach of the year generally, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, Cousins is a three-win player. Um, you know, uh, Jameis at his best is probably a three win player and Wentz at his best is like a two and a half win player, right? Like if any of those teams do really well, then Mm -hmm. I think the coach is going to win coach of the year. Um, if, if the, if the saints give the bucks, a run for their money and it starts in week two or week three, um, then Dennis Allen's going to be on the coach of the year radar. If he's not. Like if, if Brady over, like that's going to be a big game in the narrative settings too, right? Mm-hmm. If Brady comes out and smashes the New Orleans Saints, a team that has gone four and one against him over the last, uh, you know, two years, yep. people are going to notice, right? And like, so the other side of that is like, oh my God, Dennis Allen continues and then he'll be on at top of everybody's mind. I like that. I like that. I think that's a nice bet where, you know, there, there's a high correlation between the two, you know, Brady not winning MVP and that happening when you think about the odds that you're getting, right? Because it's 35 to one. Um, so I do like that, but I wouldn't think of it. I would try not to think of it as a hedge from karma perspective, because you just don't want to hedge against the goat. Don't, don't do that. That's, that's bad, bad juju. Um, I would like to hear though. And, and by the way, if you remember the syndicate, you know, share, Share the podcast with your friends. We'd love to include more people there. Um, like the podcast, subscribe, all those things. But we'd love to hear from you, like as we're getting up towards the season and we're, you know, five, five-ish weeks, six weeks away. What what would what would be an interesting thing that we could do with the syndicate all season from a betting perspective? Because when I was saying, when I just said like it would be cool to throw a party at Stadium Swim with everyone who listens to the podcast. Like that would be really, really cool. And I'm wondering how we could make that happen. Um, So let us know, hit us up. My DMs are open. I occasionally go through them, Um, but uh, you can add us or or apply to podcasts on Twitter or whatever it is. Um, And we'd love to hear some thoughts from you. Before we close out here, you uh, shared a tweet. (laughs) I thought was really, really good. Um, CBS Sports HQ tweeted this out. It's a quote from Devante Adams. Uh, on the transition from Aaron Rodgers to Derek Carr as his quarterback. He said, anytime you change quarterbacks from a Hall of Famer to a Hall of Famer, it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment. <laughs> I, I think somebody somebody came at back here and said, like, hey, I think he said even, even, or even if, but the CBS Sports HQ quotes at any time you. So – all I got to say is like, I, and I know Timo said this on Twitter, like the, you know, what, what is he supposed to say? I, I personally would just like not lie. Like I would just like, just, you know, I would, you know, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't go out of my way to say like incorrect things about Derek Carr, but mm-hmm. look, the guy's a great friend. Like th- this is, this is the kind of friendship you want to, you want These are the, like, there was a there was an Atlantic article the other day that said like don't surround yourselves with admirers. I don't mm. think that's what this is. This is just a good friend that's going to bat for his buddy. But holy buckets, does Derek Carr have to play well this year? Like Adams, yes. Adams' yes. quarterback takes right now are mirroring that of you know some of Draft Twitter's quarterback takes 
uh, you know, with respect to, and this includes my own, Justin Herbert's, uh, Josh Rosen, that wasn't mine. I wasn't a huge fan of Rosen, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like he's, he's stuck his neck out more than anybody with respect to quarterback evaluations. Is, this is there, so it's actually real quick. Who has the most pressure on themselves this year? Cause cars up there, cars up there. Mahomes is up there. Um, weirdly, I think Rogers is up there because he's getting paid 50 million and now Adams isn't there. And I think that narrative is, is such, um, and he's, mm-hmm. he's been bad in the playoffs. Like there's a lot of, a lot of pressure on Rogers. Who else? Rogers is a big, Rogers is a big season ahead of him because man, there's, and like my favorite thing is, so somebody came back with this tweet, which is freaking hilarious to me, um, which basically said that Rodgers is a much better player than Carr, but Carr has the, Carr's more clutch. And I, you know, I, I got to tell, I got to say, like, you know, Rodgers won a Super Bowl in 2010. Look, and you can team. say, okay, there's t- 10 years between there. Derek Carr has played one playoff game. And that playoff game in the fourth quarter, when the game was on the line, he spiked the ball well before he ever had to mm-hmm. and threw an interception in the end zone to the Bengals. Okay. Like, can we stop? Remember the 2016 playoffs? Rodgers Dude, was Rogers, absolute nails in that game in the Rogers, game against Dallas. Aaron Rodgers is a is an is a an assassin. Like for all the things that you want to say about Aaron Rodgers, and, and you can make fun of his cleanse and all these different things, t- saying that that there are quarterbacks other than Tom Brady that are more clutch than Aaron Rodgers or that are better than Aaron Rodgers in certain situations, like that's enough. That's a battle I would just not. I would just not fight, man. I would not fight. And um, I think it's going to be very, very interesting. This season with Aaron Rodgers is going to be fascinating. Is there going to be a, a you know someone uh, hit me up? I, I wish I remembered their name on Twitter and was like, is Alan Lazard, like the guy that, you know, like who Rogers going to find someone that he likes. And I think everyone's honed in on Christian Watson. I wouldn't be like, to me, Aaron Rodgers is a guy that really values that personal connection and that, you know, that kind of trust. And maybe it's Alan Lazard, like who kind of shows up and, and plays really well for them. Cause someone's going to have to, I mean, he ain't going to be throwing, you know, screens to Aaron Jones all all year i do think robert tunyon is is a nice bet to kind of have more of a have more of a role there um there i mean mahomes certainly has a lot right because there's no more tyreek hill and he has not played as well you know as as everyone has expected really since um that mvp season um and and i mean I, i don't know so i think it's i think those three guys are all are all really good ones. I'll I'll tell you who else has some pressure. Kyler and Lamar have some pressure uh, on them that we just talked about. Um, I think I think Trey Lance is going to have some pressure on him. Anyways, we could go for uh, for days on this. Do you have anything to close out with before we get to recommendations? Yeah, I well, this is going to be kind of a recommendation because huh? I said something that um, I said something that was you know maybe flippant. Uh, but, but I actually, so I gotta say, I listened to a podcast called talk bill, which was by Michael Rosenbaum and mm. Tom Welling who played Superman and Lex Luthor in Smallville. And it was actually like, I actually listened to it. So I have to take back my criticism of people who listen to podcasts about TV shows that happened in the past. <laughs> Um, I, I will uh, amend my criticism of these people. I apologize. I was wrong. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Amen. Because, you know, again, like, you know, sometimes you say things and, and you, you don't have all of the information. And, and as I said, when the world changes, I change my mind, George. I'm just, uh, I'm happy that you found, found peace, found peace in your life. Um, Okay, is that your only recommendation? No, I I have one. I was reading this book on the flight, and I'm almost finished with it, but I I've read enough to know that it's good. Scientist E. O. Wilson: A Life in Nature by Richard Rhodes. Richard Rhodes, one of the more famous scientific historians of all time. E. O. Wilson talked about as 
sort of the Darwin successor as far as, you know, uh, putting together a lot of the, the theory behind population ecology and entomology and things like that. Very compelling person. Did more with one eye, George, than I could ever do with two. <laughs> uh, so, so a good book there. I like it. I have two recommendations in there for you. These are the two restaurants that if I go to Philadelphia, I have to go to. Um, one of them is very, very well known. The other is not as well known. Both of them are Middle Eastern restaurants. The first is a Lebanese restaurant called Suraya, S-U-R-A-Y-A. It is very, 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 very good. Uh, I enjoyed everything that I had there. Um, and if you have not had, by the way, Lebanese or Middle Eastern food before, it's it's awesome. Um, I will... I can even give you, because this is the type of guy that I am, I can even give you um, like menu recommendations for what's on there, um, which <laughs> I'm sure that you will want. So you can hit me up later. And if you want uh, menu recommendations, you can, you can, uh, you can ask me as well on, you know, if you're listening. Um, but uh, it's very, very, very good. Um, and I, I will say that I'll give one out. My favorite uh, dish that they have is something called kibbe naya, which is a raw lamb. It's kind of like a steak tartare, but it's made with lamb. You should only get it if you go to a really good place, but a really good place will do it. And it is phenomenal. Uh, I couldn't recommend it uh, high, more highly. And then the, the second place is a place called Zahab. This place is very well known. It's probably, probably one I think of I've been to that one before. Restaurants. Now, I actually think Saraya is better than Zahab. But Zahav is very good. They have their own cookbook and all this stuff. Uh, it is very, very good. Um, and uh, it's Z-A-H-A-V. That's the one that everyone will tell you to go to. And I can confirm that it's good. You'll probably have to wait a little while, though. Um, so uh, I personally, I think Sarai is a little bit better, but yeah, both very, very good. So those are my recommendations. I hope you enjoy Philadelphia. And if anyone else is out there, you can go check those out as well. That was our podcast. We'll be back with you on Wednesday. Eric, enjoy your time in Philly.